I'm Kirk Harnack. On This Week in Radio Tech, I'm joined by Tom Ray, Chris Tarr, and Joey Cummins. We talk about radio in American Samoa. Coming up. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth is provided by CashFly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This week in Radio Tech, episode 79, recorded April 20th, 2011. Palangi Joe. Hello and welcome to This Week in Radio Tech. I'm Kirk Harnack and I'm welcoming you into the show. This is the show where we talk about everything from the microphone and the stylus uh, all the way through the audio console and uh, up to the top of the tower. This is we talk about radio technology. And hey, that includes audio and RF technology and sometimes some allied technologies, including uh, IP and, and well, IT infrastructure technology more and more and more. So whether that RF is standard AM or FM or getting a digital signal out to people with mobile devices and cars and or even talking to submarines under the ocean. We, uh, we, we talk about it here on This Week in Radio Tech. Uh, joining us on this episode, two of my favorite co-hosts. First of all, the Hudson Valley of New York brings us Tom Ray from WOR. Hi, Tom. Speaking of submarines under the ocean, hey, Kirk, good evening, Kirk. How are you doing this evening? I'm, I'm great. VP uh, Engineering at uh, WOR Radio and Buckley Broadcasting in New York City, and I'm up here in the Hudson Valley, about 50 miles north of New York City and 15 miles west of West Point, and I've resolved that uh, sometime this summer I am going to see the West Point Army Band in concert. <laughs> All right. Well, you, you take a little camera out there and take a couple pictures for us. Or do oh, a live remote. remote. Hey, that could be cool. Uh, <laughs> Tom, we missed you the last couple of weeks. I'm glad you're back with us. And we've got quite an interesting show, well, quite an interesting guest we'll get to in just a minute. Next, uh, from um, uh, Muckwanico, Wisconsin, let's bring in Chris Tarr, the Ninjaneer. Hi, Tom, uh, Chris. Hello there. How are you? I'm great. Tell us about Chris Tarr. I am the Geek Jedi. I'm uh, the Director of Engineering for Intercom's radio stations in Madison and Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And I also uh, run with a friend of mine, the Engineering Message Board, uh, BroadcastEngineering.info. And a good place for engineers to go to uh, find out what they need to know or just have a good argument. Uh, you know, we run the gamut. It's kind of like an SBE meeting on the, on the uh, Internet. Yeah, yeah, with less food and more drinking. <laughs> a lot more drinking, yes. <laughs> hey, I got a ham radio question for Tom. Tom, is it okay to be on the ham radio doing the ham radio thing while you're intoxicated? You know, I don't think there's a uh, I don't think there's a specific regulation against that, but it would uh, probably come under the uh, uh, FCC's uh, good character regulation uh, in regards <laughs> to. Know, I don't uh, think there is a rule for us to be able to hold licensing. You know what? Kirk is a good character, so. <laughs> you know, I, don't, I don't believe there's a rule for that, but I do believe it is encouraged. <laughs> <laughs> well, I only drink wines of good character. <laughs> All right. Hey, let's uh, let's bring in our, our guest. I'm so pleased to have a guy that we normally can't bring on the show because he just lives too darn far away in a place too remote. Uh, and although they ran, ran an undersea cable, maybe it'll get better. And that is uh, my friend Joey Cummings, uh, who's the VP of South Seas Broadcasting. Hello, Joey. Hey, guys. How's it happening? I understand. It's good. I understand you are you're in your stateside. You're in the mainland right now. But normally you hang out in Pongo Pongo, American Samoa. Uh, tell us a little bit about what you do in Samoa and what the heck you're doing here stateside now. Yeah, I'm the VP and GM of South Seas Broadcasting. We have a couple of FMs and some uh, television interest on the uh, territory of American Samoa, the big island of Tutuila. And when I say big, I mean about 20 miles long and about five miles wide at the very uh, widest spot. So it's a pretty insignificant dot out in the middle of the ocean, so small that if you look at it on a globe, the small blob of ink that they use to represent it is actually too large. Uh, but <laughs> yeah, I'm currently in the States to uh, visit my new niece. I have a, a new a young one and I wanted to come and, and count the fingers and toes and I'm in Concord, California. Oh, that's not Cal too far from, uh, from Petaluma, the, the, the Twit Network. No, 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 it's not. I'm here visiting Captain Kirk, too. 
<laughs> yeah, I see. <laughs> see. Well, no, no proper geek uh, room would be complete without a Captain Kirk stand-up. Never. Yeah. Hey, so uh, we're going to talk about a couple of topical topics, and uh, then we're going to wind our way into talking about American Samoa and, and what's going on there in radio and some of the adventures, Joey, that you've had uh, in, uh, in, in doing that. Hey, let's, uh, let's kind of wrap up NAB. We did a, a, a shoot a live show from the NAB, from the Twit stage there last week. And uh, I want to bring uh, Tom and, and Chris Tarr to bear on that subject. Did you guys get a chance to, to review or, or watch uh, the tort that we did from out there? Unfortunately, no. I've been oh. uh, up to my earlobes and in, uh, in things going on. I just haven't had a chance. Maybe you better tell us what, what, has, what transpired with your world while we were gone. Chris Tarr, uh, did you uh, get to get any feedback from NAB from your friends? I did. I'd actually, uh, I, I watched uh, Twit also from NAB when you guys were out there doing the show. It looked great. But uh, I, I, it's funny how, uh, and, and I think you guys actually mentioned it, how all of a sudden, you know, we had a couple of years there with the uh, NAB radio show, or the, the broadcast show, where uh, attendance was pretty down. And uh, this, this past session looked like there was, uh, there was quite an uptick in vendors and people attending, which I think is great. Um, and it sounds like it was all about 3D. In fact, uh, somebody, I think it was on Twitter, had made a joke about how uh, they were just going to throw an eye patch on because they were, they were getting tired of getting stopped to be asked to look at things in 3D out of the show floor. Uh, so, you know, it sounds like that, that was a big thing. But the, the feedback I've gotten from the people who went, uh, everybody said it was a fantastic show. You know, this 3D is everywhere. I, in fact, I heard at the, at the truckers' convention uh, next month, uh, they're going to have 3D CB, and that's that's looking pretty scary. <laughs> <sighs> Try the beef tips, folks. He'll be here all week. Um, now, of course, in, in radio, we don't have 3D. We did, we did have some uh, advances in technology showing up in, in the radio hall. One of the of the uh, uh, vendors, Comrex, and you guys have had Tom Hartnett from uh, Comrex on, they showed a product just totally out of the ballpark for, for Comrex, who's been an audio company. Uh, they showed a camera, um, uh, well, uh, an IP codec for video a as well as audio that fits on the back of a professional TV camera. Uh, an ENG style camera. So that was pretty cool. Uh, Harris uh, notably showed a uh, 20 kilowatt capable uh, FM and HD transmitter that fits in a single uh, 19 inch equipment rack. That was pretty impressive to get that much power out of that little space. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Was that, did, did that fill the entire rack, or was that just uh, how many how many rack spaces did you estimate that was? It seems like uh, Chris Tobin saw that, and, or maybe it was Charlie Wooten that saw that, and said that there was still some space for more. In fact, oh, here, there's an ad for it in uh, Radio World. So there you go, uh, Harris. We're a great Holy radio. Holy cow, company. that is fantastic. And, uh, what are they saying here? It's called the Flexiva FM transmitter. And they're saying up to 20 kilowatts using the most compact design on the market today. You know, the hamsters have a really little cage to run in. <laughs> uh, well, they're really uh, little guys. They don't need much space. It's, it's FM plus HD, and it looks like here, uh, let me see if I can, does this work at all? Well, I guess it kind of mm -hmm. does. Yeah, yeah. yeah, it works. Oh, wait, there we go. So it's got, uh, it's got the exciter in it, and uh, then it's got two big honking power thing modules with air intakes on the front. So anyway, it's in, the, it's in Radio World, the latest one that just came in. Actually, I think there isn't the, the NAB edition of Radio World, too, the, the last edition. They, they had a picture of that transmitter. Um, uh, who else uh, came out with stuff? Well, of course, I worked in the, in the Telos booth because that's who I work for. And uh, we, we introduced a, a new console, a $6,000 IP audio console uh, called the, the Radius that ships in a couple of months. And, oh, the, uh, yeah, one of the big hits of the show was this guy, Leif Clayson, a name that I hadn't heard of until about a year ago because I heard he was working with our sister company, uh, Linear Acoustic. And Leif has um, uh, this software. Oh, man, what's the name of the software that... Uh, that that he puts out that you can make your own FM processor. Oh gosh, the, the uh, chat room. Somebody keep a, keep an eye on the chat room because I'm sure the chat room will have uh, uh, will have a um, uh, an idea of, of that. I guess I could go to the chat room and, and maybe find out. Um, so uh, so Leif's uh, processor in software, he's now adapted to be a processor in hardware because he's joined up with folks at Omnia. And one thing that he demonstrated. At this on the show last week, which by the way, if you want to see it, you can go to YouTube, go to the Twit channel on YouTube, and you can uh, watch Twit episode number seventy-eight from the NAB show. And Leif was on 
uh, for a good oh, 15 minutes or so, and he explained some technology called the declipper. Ah, from the chat room, it's the breakaway processor. There you go. Lake's been working on this breakaway processor. Very cool, very feature-rich, runs on a PC. But uh, the features in Breakaway are in the Omnia 9, plus a bunch more features. And um, uh, this declipper is just amazing. It's a declipper plus uh, a, a, a process he calls undo. It de-hyper-compresses uh, the audio so that now he can go process it in the way that he thinks is right. And hopefully the broadcaster uh, thinks uh, is right. Uh, Chris or Tom, do you guys know anything about this kind of technology, this declipping? No, I mean, no. <laughs> I, 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 mean I mean, are you... Are, are you talking taking the actual song and and deprocessing it, or are you ta or are you processing the audio first, then taking it apart and processing it? <laughs> no, again? Uh, we're, we're we're unprocessing the way the song was processed. And the, the thinking is here that that you know a lot of record producers want the music to be loud on the CD or for the uh, the the AAC or MP3 cut that you buy from Amazon or iTunes, and so uh, songs now are mastered pretty loud with real by golly nasty clipping in them, and and, and I, I don't know what tools that that. Uh, um, song mu music producers and mastering guys have to use. It'd really be good to find this out. I, I, I've heard they have some pretty basic tools, like maybe some diodes, uh, to do the clipping. With. <laughs> but <laughs> but if you look at it on a on a uh, on an oscilloscope, it just looks clipped and it doesn't sound so good. Well. Okay, I know people can overprocess FM, and I know they do every day. But it's certainly possible for Omnia or Orban processors and, 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 and other FM processors, AM ones too, to make uh, uh, audio look pretty clipped without sounding so clipped because they have some really good ways of hiding the distortion uh, that, res that is the result of, of such clipping. So uh, Leif, and in association with a guy from the Netherlands named Hans, uh, who I met, but we didn't get to interview on the show last week, uh, uh, Hans has this extremely cool algorithm that uh, declips uh, clipped audio, and it replaces the clipping with what looks like real by-golly waveforms that probably should have been there in the first place. And it's not perfect, but it sounds near perfect. It's just amazing uh, what, what they can do. And after talking with some... Um, uh, some engineers at the NAB show. It's a great time for you know sharing ideas back and forth. Hans, who by the way is not in the audio business, is actually in the medical imaging business. Hans um, got some more ideas on how to improve his algorithm. So he's going to come back with the next generation of the declipper. Um, Leif will continue working on his uh, undo process, and um, um, there you go. This will be in the uh, Omnia Nine and the Omnia Eleven. Uh, Joey uh, reminds me in our chat room that there's a YouTube uh, of Leif. Uh, there's a YouTube video uh, of Leif it, describing. It's, it's not Leif, clip. but uh, it, somebody has uh, taken and this is not the only guy that's uh, attempting this magic ah, because definitely sure. it's an issue because if you look at these waveforms, they're just incredible. They look like they have crew cuts and uh, it's just unacceptable. It sounds just bloody harsh on yeah. the ears and they can take them and they can fix them. And it's just such a shame. I mean, it's, it's blatant too. Well, you know, so, unfortunately, I think this could be kind of uh, uh, a little dangerous because, you know, after you declip and after you deprocess, you'll find out what some of these people really sound like. <laughs> <laughs> Boy. <laughs> somebody, was a, somebody said of Leif's breakaway processor, or maybe it was the Omni and I, and they, they, they said, you know, that processor is so good, we can actually hear the explicit lyrics now. <laughs> <laughs> See, I I'm not worried about it because, you know, I'll unclip it and then clip the crud out of it again when I put it back on the air. So it's all right. You know, I'll just right. clean it up and then smash it again. Right. But, but I, listen, I'm, I'm people may think I'm fooling myself or talking gibberish here. There, there's ways to do clipping and, and there's ways not to do clipping. And I got to say, you know, the, the folks who process audio professionally for a broadcast, uh, and that would include our friends at Orban and, and the folks at Vorsis and the folks at, at Omnia and, and the other companies around the world too, they know something about doing this. Um, and I got to say, especially the, the top of the line guys, you know, the Orbans and, and, and the, the Frank Fodies of, of the world um, and, for, and the guys that I know, Corny Gould, well, uh, uh, Greg Ogan who we've had on the show, uh, and Leif Place, and these guys understand how to um, process audio so that it's good and loud and consistent and even sounds more exciting than the, than the original cut, but they know how to hide the distortion. They've got some incredible techniques for doing clipping in, in a multi-band environment and then taking the distortion that occurs from various different audible bands and hiding it or getting rid of it or, or filtering it out uh, in, in such ways that you can just have incredible loudness and clarity without... Uh, it's sounding really but, grungy. And, you know, know 
remember, well, remember the days of the of the modulation scientist clippers, you know, and, and how you could sit there and watch the pilot just uh, you know get clipped as well as you know with the baseband and SEA trash and you know how how dirty those sounded. I mean, we had, we had some some comparisons where you could it almost sounded like there was static in the audio and it was just the result of all that clipping. And nowadays, you know, you can do away with those baseband clippers just because the clippers in the audio processors have gotten so so good that you can achieve that same loudness without any of the, the distortion and any of the noise of the baseband. It's fantastic. And, you know, I, I would wonder why in, in a lot of these studio recordings and such, why do they, coming, coming from the studio, why does it need to be so clipped and loud? I, I just don't get it. Well, um, I think, you, you, think that you think you'd want it to be pristine. I, I know some people look for a, uh, either a signature or they're, or they're looking for something to make it stand out. You, you know, one of the songs that comes to mind from the 70s was Go All the Way by the Raspberries, where, I mean, the VU meter didn't move. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great example of a wall of sound. Um, yeah, but, was that but, produced by Phil Spector? They were looking for an effect, but yeah. geez. Yeah. <laughs> Well, you know, there was there was a study that came out. Um, I've referred to this before. It was probably two or three years ago now, where they took uh, college age students and they played uh, clips uh, of songs at various bit rates and various you know distortion levels and things like that. And people actually preferred the sound of the low bit rate MP3. And I, I think that you know people have grown up with audio that isn't pristine. That when they hear something that's pristine, they think there's something wrong with it. It sounds odd or kind of foreign to them. It's kind of that whole effect when uh, you know HD, HD radio first came out, and we weren't processing the the HD version very well, and people almost found it a little disjointed when you know the audio just opened right up. So uh, I think that's probably part of it. Is is people have come to uh, you know, they've come to get used to that kind of loud, noisy kind of audio, and uh, if they think they prefer it, <laughs> just because that's what they're used to. I'll answer Tom's question. Uh, Tom, you know, I, I've worked at a lot of country music stations, and so um, you take an artist like George Strait. Uh, if you listen to songs from the early 80s, like um, uh, there's a song you did called uh, The Fireman. Oh, they call me the fireman. That's my name. I, you know, spend, uh, I run around all over town putting out old flames. Okay. Uh, if you listen to that song, and then you listen to one of his um, much more recent songs, like from, uh, I guess, the, uh, the early 2000s, uh, late 1990s, uh, or even something more than that, well, like Oceanfront Property, um, uh, you're gonna, the, the old song from the 80s sounds really dead by comparison to the, the, the processed newer version. Um, and I, in fact, I, 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 you know, some of this is older music I like, but it, it, it just kind of lays there in the headphones and blah, 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 blah. It just doesn't sound all that exciting. Uh, so maybe I'm just too hyped up on, on the drug myself. Um, now, I'm not saying that his songs um, are well processed either, but they certainly are, are more processed. Um, and I think there's, there's pressure from record, you know, from act producers uh, to say, you know, make sure we stand up and print really loud on, on the CD. Uh, now, somebody in the chat room asked, well, why doesn't Leif uh, make, uh, make tools for record producers to use? Uh, I'm, he certainly could. <laughs> well, he's, no, he certainly could. And actually, Omnia for the last um, eight years has had a, a box called the Omnia 6 CD which uh, doesn't have the FM clipper in it. It's, it's slightly different software that does uh, uh, multiband uh, AGC and multiband limiting, but it's, it's look-ahead limiting for the most part. And uh, you know, we, we've had a few record producers uh, buy this box and use it to produce CDs. And the processing that it does is, is good and loud, and you can make it sound really sweet. Uh, and it's pretty compatible with uh, FM radio processing. You, you wouldn't have to run it through a declipper. Um, honestly, it's, it's not a market that we've gone after a whole lot. I would imagine that you know, there are presets and settings in Orban processors that one could use, turn off the pre-emphasis, that one could use for making you know, mastered music sound louder and, and better. Um, you know, Greg Oganowski is a master, for example, at, at bass processing. I've always liked his presets, and, and so I, I think the record producers would do very well to do that. Why they don't, I don't know. It's maybe not, not something that, that, they, that they know about that well. Did someone else say was, yeah, go ahead. I think Chris was hitting on uh, something that was uh, pretty cogent, uh, where some people are looking for ways to make it sound worse because that's what they're used to hearing but there's a flip side to that as well there are, there are people that are looking for sneaky hacky type ways to make things sound better that sound worse that don't have access to this uh, uh, declipping uh, software I think it was a Metallica uh, release a year or two ago that came out and it was 
phenomenally just over modulated right off the CD. It, like I said before, it just had a crew cut. And somehow they looked at the same song on a release of Guitar Hero, the video game, the same song, but it was far less modulated. So they found a way to crack the disc, pull the uh, audio, uh, the, uh, the instrumental audio, off of that and uh, remove the sound effects because they found that the uh, the uh, unprocessed or the the lesser processed version from Guitar Hero was far more pleasant to the ear whenever uh, you know uh, listened to separately away from the sound effects of the video game. So th there are people that are looking to make it sound better as well as the flip side of people that prefer the sound of an MP3. You know, and Bob Orban had, has a great quote. He still, to this day, uses it, which is, you know, radios have a volume knob, but they don't have, uh, how do you put it, a deep density knob. So, you know, you can, you can, you know, you crank it up and you can make it really loud, but, you know, that's the problem is, you know, the, the reality of it is we can all adjust the volume. You know, if the, if the song's not loud enough, we can all turn it up. Unfortunately, we can't declip it. And, you know, there's no knob on the radio to do that. So, but it's the same way, it's the same thing with, with top 40 stations that pitch their music. You know, you, you, it's just, you know, we're always trying to get that signature sound. And you're always trying to get that, uh, you know, one, you know, it goes one more than the next guy. And, and yeah. you know, I think what happens is people, the consumers, they get used to that. And so when you give them something that's nice and clean and pristine, they go, there's something wrong with that. And, and you can tell that when people buy, you know, CDs of, of artists, like, for example, that a top 40 station's playing in town and it's pitch 3%. And you go and you buy the CD, you put in the CD player, and you go, there's something wrong with this. It doesn't sound right. And uh, so I, I think, you know, there's a lot of people in this chain that are guilty in this situation. I think it's the record companies. I think radio stations. I think, you know, there's a whole lot of people that have gone a long way to purposely destroy the, you know, as, as I like to say, in radio, we're probably one of the only businesses on the planet that, you know, takes very large steps to kind of destroy the product that we're given in the first place. Well, and, and that, that's the problem. I, mean, I can agree with you, but I have to disagree with you. you know, if, if you want to, uh, if, if you played songs with no processing at all uh, for listening in the car when you're driving down the road, you'd be cranking that volume control up and down and up and down, depending, especially if it's a, a station that plays a, a, a mix of the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, and, and today. Uh, there's such a wide variety. Wouldn't you agree with that? Oh, sure. No, I, I agree. And I think that, you know, it's just like any other spice. You know, a little bit would be great. Unfortunately, <laughs> we've gone to putting a whole bunch of stuff on there. And, and believe hey. me, I am, I am probably more guilty than anybody in my market of that. You know, I've got, you know, two radio stations that are just screaming off the dial. Uh, you know, so, I mean, I, I get it. It's a you know, it's, it's not only, it's, you know, it started out where it was to protect the transmitter long ago that's what you know the game controllers were, were supposed to do then it was okay we're going to fix the ambient noise problem now it's just essentially let's be as loud as we can and you know go on more than the next guy and you know once we went from uh you know just kind of using processing as a little bit of a spice to that's the recipe i think that's where things started to go south chris have Personally, you ever had as far as uh, pitching pitching music goes I still think that if you had four CD players in the studio, loaded them all, and fired them all at the same time, you could really say that nobody gives you more music. <laughs> <laughs> I say put one on the left channel and then another one on the right channel, and then you could have two songs go up to figure yeah. out which one you like better. That's right. We play 120 <laughs> minutes of music every hour. Um, uh, Chris, uh, you, your spice analogy is pretty good. Uh, have you ever had Thai food? You know, th Thai food is, is the food that, that kisses you on one cheek and slaps you on the other. Put it, put it this way, Kurt. I've heard a lot of Thai food on the radio. <laughs> I've heard a lot of Mama Mia on the radio. Well, um, uh, hey, Burke has queued up. Uh, just a, We're going to watch just a moment here cause, uh, of a clip. I want you to uh, take a look at this clip. Is it with Leif Clayson? Burke, go ahead and play it, and, and I can narrate over it. I, I, I don't want to play very much of it. I just want to show folks where they can go. Here we go. Ah, yeah. Okay, this is Leif Clayson uh, describing uh, how his um, processor is working, and he goes into describing the detail about the uh, about the declipper. And this was uh, from, I believe, this may have been from uh, the processing days, uh, processing freak days in in, in the Netherlands. Um, we'll get the uh, the link for that up on the show notes. 
And that's on, or if you want to just uh, go to YouTube, don't do it now, continue watching the show. Uh, go to YouTube and, and do a search for Omnia 9 or uh, Leif Clayson. Um, and you should be able to, uh, to find this. I think it's four parts. And Leif, Leif was telling us on the show last week, he said, oh, no, don't watch that terrible video. Apparently he had some, uh, some technical problems at the beginning of the, of the presentation, but they all got squared away but by the end of it. So you can, you can look at that, and Leif will have some more teaching later on. He's, just, he's a really interesting guy, um, the uh, son of um, Jamaican and Swedish parents, and now he's living in Thailand. So really interesting fellow. Uh, listen, we're going to have uh, some stories from you right about now talking about uh, <laughs> engineering uh, challenges and running radio in general in American Samoa. And uh, let me set the stage just a little bit. I, I was very privileged some years ago, gee, this must have been in the mid-90s, when a guy named Larry Fuss, who I had um, uh, known for a while and been associated with at some radio stations, uh, he approached me and said, uh, hey, would you like to own a radio station in American Samoa? And I said, what? Where? He said, well, he says, I've been um, looking at this first come, first serve list. And this was a list the FCC used to put out of first come, first serve open licenses. And the first tenderable application to come along, that person, if it was a valid uh, application, would get the license. Now, these were usually stations in places like West Undershirt, Arkansas, you know, places where hardly anybody lived. And uh, these were stations that at one point were allocated to the FCC's table of allotments, the FM table of allotments. These were all FM stations, how they worked. Um, and somebody had abandoned the idea, was no longer interested. So these were just open. They were allotted, but nobody had the license. So Larry found a couple in American Samoa, or he found this place called um, Pago Pago AS. Yeah. AS, where's that? AS, is that uh, Arkansas? Uh, no, <laughs> Arkansas. Uh, is, that, is, that, is that Alaska? Uh, no, that's AK. Okay. <laughs> no, no, no. Alabama. No, there's no S in Alabama. So he had to open a book and do some looking, and uh, this might have been even you know pre-real internet. And if, then he found, aha, it's American Samoa. Where is that? So he spun the globe and found out <laughs> to get to American Samoa, you fly to Hawaii, and then you turn left. And you go about halfway to New Zealand. There's a little part of America just south of the equator. Uh, consists of several islands, I guess uh, four or five islands or so. And the main island is called Tutuila. And the capital city there is, turns out it's called Pongo Pongo, American Samoa. And there was a radio station license available there. And another one in a town on the other side of the island called Leone. And so back in that day, back, back then, uh, before the Telecom Act of the 96 was passed, uh, the same company could not own both of these FM stations. So Larry applied for one, and I applied for the other one. And um, we were granted both licenses eventually, and uh, and then I ended up selling my license and put the money in to you know do the other one, and so we ran the little radio station for a while, but we didn't have a good general manager. We need somebody with skills, with game, with uh, you know come out, come down there and make the radio sound really great, and, and uh, sell some ads too, and and uh, hire a staff and, and run everything. So we ran into. Joey Cummings, who had worked with me in uh, Mississippi radio. So uh, th now, to this point, Joey was not an engineer. But, you know, old Kirk Harnack can't get down to American Samoa just every day. So, so we, we're going we're to bypass all of uh, Jerry's troubles and tribulations on the air and go straight to the, uh, the engineering stories. So let me bring you on in, Joey. Hi, I'm sorry. I've been, I just wanted to set it up so people kind of knew, uh, knew the background here. Yeah, it's uh, very far away, and it is most challenging because it is so far away and it is so small. Everything that you take for granted just doesn't work like you expect it to. Electricity, eh, maybe 110 volts could be 120 volts. Uh, if you need to make a phone call, well, 10 cents a minute could be $5 a minute. If, you, if I wanted to have this experience with, uh, with Twert, then uh, if, if I wanted to have the same amount of internet that I'm using right now, the bandwidth, I'd pay about $10,000 a month. That's U.S. dollars. Gee, man. yeah, I remember for the longest time there, we had, uh, we shared like one, with 10 other people, or with, with nine other people, we had one-tenth of 512 kilobits per second. We still and do, Kirk. And it, and it, oh, we do? And it cost uh -huh. us, at, at, back then it cost us 500 a month. I think Larry said the cost went down. 450 uh, that's savings for you. <laughs> for one-tenth of half a meg. Yeah, yeah, we average about 128, maybe 200 on a good day. Oh, gee, money. It's, it takes forever. You know, every day it, 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 this, this affects you in ways like you want to you get your Microsoft updates done? <laughs> well, you know, no. You start them, at, start them at 6 p.m. when everybody goes home, the bandwidth goes up. 
and mm -hmm. uh, and then the next by the next morning you might have some some uh, updates ready ready to to put in there. Uh, for example, uh, our stations. The, uh, I'm part owner of these stations, and Joey is too. We we stream from uh, from the website. You can go to uh, Joey. Correct? Is it ninety three khj tv? I'm sorry. Dot fm. That's correct. Okay, ninety three khj dot fm. And if you go there, you can click a button and do some streaming. But, hey, don't everybody all at once. Uh, we send one stream from American Samoa to a server in Las Vegas. And from there, we can handle about, I don't know, 30 people or so. Uh, so uh, you know, the, the, the bandwidth does come is very precious between uh, American Samoa and the mainland. So I'm sorry, that John, was, I, I interrupted. Go on with, the, with your stories. No, that's a, that's a very uh, handy bit of engineering and very typical of what it takes to uh, solve a problem. Um, if, if we want streaming, yeah, okay, we'll have streaming, but we can't stream to everybody, so we'll send it to Las Vegas. And that was, uh, that was some of your handiwork, Kirk. And uh, there's just a ton of other examples of, uh, of uh, the things that we've done to get by and some of the uh, cheap cheap equipment that we'll use to uh, serve in the in the steed of uh, more expensive gear and uh, and means but more so than the the uh, solutions that you get to plan it's the solutions that you have to come up with off the top of your head whenever there's something akin to an emergency or uh, heavy weather or something like that it's those kinds of things that uh, really surprise me at the end of the day when I look back and I go did I really just do that and uh, that's some of the things we were talking about before whenever uh, when we were talking before the show I've uh, alerted Burke to the uh, location where you have some photos uh, stored, Joey, and he'll be bringing some of these up soon. Tell, you know, American Samoa came in the news, uh, what, about a year and a half ago with uh, this horrible tsunami. that uh, We saw one hit Japan not long ago, and there were lots of cameras in Japan to cover everything. Not so many cameras in American Samoa recording the events. Talk to us about that. What caused it and what happened and how, how was our station really affected uh, pretty significantly compared to, well, because of its location. Yeah, we got rocked. I, I think we, we did get some uh, footage. Um, I, I got some footage as it happened. If you'll go to YouTube and Google my name and Tsunami, it should be popped up. I think every network known to man stole my footage and, uh, <laughs> and listed it as their own. But uh, the, uh, the radio station sits at sea level basically but we are on the second floor of a two-story building a concrete building and that made it very possible for us to to stay above the water but it was uh, early in the morning and uh, just before our seven o'clock news we uh, we uh, filled this earthquake it lasted for a couple of minutes and at that time talks of tsunamis weren't really um, that really wasn't something that came up a lot. So there wasn't uh, a lot of protocol as far as drills. And, and um, while we did have EAS up, um, th there really wasn't uh, a good way for people to determine, okay, was this a tsunami warning level of event? Well, what do they do? They call the Pacific Tsunami Warning Center in Hawaii. And they were trying to get information from them, but they it takes them a long time to to process data from their buoys that are out at sea to uh, detect, um, r you know, r rising and, and lowering seawaters. Eventually, we knew that something was going to happen because the waters were starting to recede. So we, we activated EAS. We, we, um, we, we didn't have any other official warning, but we decided to send a tsunami warning via EAS. And it was, it was a, a pretty spooky feeling to push those buttons and, and choose that off the list of events, got to say. But uh, it, it wasn't a minute later. The uh, entire harbor area of American Samoa and many other villages were inundated with 10, 20, maybe even 30 feet of water. It, it rocked the place pretty hard. So I understand that actually American Samoa didn't get the brunt of this. It wasn't a Western Samoa, which is, well, now called the independent nation of Samoa, a different country 60 or so miles away. Didn't, didn't they get the, the worst of it? Yeah, they did only because they have significantly more landmass and, and more coastline. Uh, it came from the south. And while a lot of American Samoa, the inhabited region, does face south, um, most of the the people in uh, neighboring Western Samoa live on the northern side, and that that means that uh, you're sort of looking at 
outlying villages and, and um, backwoods, as you might call them back here on the, in the States. And so they didn't have really as much a warning or alert what was going on and plus the topography there is a lot in american samoa you you hit land and almost immediately you're going straight up a mountain in western samoa you're um, it, it it just gradually goes uphill so the um like in japan the uh, waters flowed for half a mile inland that i understand in some places so it was it was rocking they were bigger and the topography was such that they lost like 100 people in american samoa i believe we lost 34 so when the tsunami hit, when it came into the harbor and, and our, you, the station, the, the, the office and studios where you are, uh, are located at, at, the, at the, is it the mouth? Not the mouth of the harbor. It's the end of the harbor. Uh, so that's the where the belly. The, the belly of the harbor. Um, um, and see, it seems like was the first thing that really got wiped out was our backup generator? Absolutely. That's exactly what happened. Uh, we have a very large backup generator, or at least we did. It's the size of a small, like, 20-foot container. And it was up on uh, a foundation three or four feet above the ground, but the water was just... There's no way you could you could resist it because along with the water, it was pushing boats, it was pushing cars, it was pushing debris from the bottom of the of the harbor. Years and years of, of just crap that was... Ooh. At the bottom, yeah, <laughs> steel barrels and junk metal and that, that sort of thing. So a, as it uh, approached the building, it picked up that generator. It's got to be tons. And it lifted it 40 or 50 feet back behind the building. It was seriously intense water. So I, I, I take it this took the studio off the air pretty quickly. Yeah, we, we had backup batteries. Uh, UPSs gave us about maybe five, ten minutes, and we used that to just keep telling people to go uphill and tell them what was happening. We, we sent um, we sent two EAS warnings. We sent an earthquake warning and then followed by a tsunami warning. And uh, after that, it was just talking as much as we could, trying to get as much information as we could. But before before long, it was just us. You know, it's really strange feeling. Um, the we were on the air. I had just set up this joke. It, the setup had lasted for 20 minutes. And, and I was ready to deliver the punchline whenever the shaking started. And so I was really caught off guard. But you know what? I was handling it. I was just delivering your standard earthquake information. Get in a doorway, under a desk, don't let anything fall on you, that sort of thing. And I, I just felt very calm and serene. The water, you know, send the EAS warnings, calm and serene. The water's coming, we're still on the air, calm and serene. Then the batteries give out and we're dead, a dead stick. It was only until I lost the protection of my live microphone, I didn't feel any bad vibes whatsoever. There was a job to be done, but as soon as that mic went off, I was like, oh man, what are we doing here? There was a uh, as you can imagine, a, a significant amount of consternation and panic. I uh, I heard that there was a a woman in an office on the first floor, kind of below the radio station, and the floodwaters came up and up and up and up. And it, it, am I right about this? Did, did she have a rather harrowing experience? Yeah, she was uh, she was a lady with child about eight months. Uh, you mean she was child. pregnant? Yes, yeah, correct. Oh my goodness. And, okay, pregnant Samoan woman woman was she Samoan? Yeah. Yeah, probably, that's right. She, probably kind of a big lady if she's Samoan, right? Uh, she she is uh, not a size two. No. Okay. So so uh, so anyway, water. You said the station's on the second floor. Water's coming in from the harbor from the tsunami. What did she do? After the earthquake, it made her want to have to go to the bathroom. <laughs> All of that shaking on a pregnant lady. So she did. She got up from her desk and she went to the bathroom. As she was coming out, the water pushed a truck through the wall and cremated her desk. Just boom, splintered everywhere. So she survived that. So here comes the water. She hops on a desk, water's higher. She gets on top of a four drawer filing cabinet. Pretty soon she's knocking the uh, suspended ceiling tiles out and looking for uh, ducting or anything else inside of there to grab onto so she doesn't get swept away. And she's pretty much uh, up to her neck in the water. And she feels things bumping against her and the baby. But she did hold on long enough for the water to go down. And uh, she climbed her way over all the de debris, 
got up the stairs. She was cut up a little bit on her legs, but she was fine. A month later, the baby was born. The baby was fine. And, uh, yeah, I mean, it, it's those kind of stories. I mean, if you, if you think that one is just uh, harrowing, there are, there are a thousand more just like it for every single person that was around that water. And not all the stories ended well, but at least at least that one end, ended pretty well. Hey, we're going to turn our attention to the transmitter sites uh, because the, we have some pretty interesting transmitter sites in Samoa, and you brought some pictures. Uh, we're going to get to the pictures in just a second, but first I want to describe one thing about how the AC power gets to, uh, I guess, what's kind of our main transmitter site at, at the moment on uh, on a mountain that's called, um, it's called a lava, oh, right? Yes. Mount a lava. It's a Go ahead. It's a single span uh, that goes down from the power, the power plant, uh, which is at sea level. And it's a single span that goes from sea level straight up about 1,600 feet, three wires for the three phases. And it's, uh, it's a pretty interesting angle. Maybe over a quarter of a mile, it goes from uh, sea level to 1,600 feet. So that's, that, that's a serious trip, a high-tension well, line. Just about a 45 degree angle because it's 1,600 feet up, and it's a. I, I've looked at this on a topo map. It's not but 14 or 1,600 feet. From, okay, there, there you see it. That picture there. That picture was taken from. Um, uh, I, I think from the uh, wooden platform that's on top of a lava, and this is right next to where the power lines come up. You can't see the power lines here, but down at sea level, right up against the ocean, uh, there's a road that hugs the, uh, hugs the ocean there, and uh, a place called Satala, that's the, the, the main power generating plant for American Samoa, uh, for the island of Tutuila. It's right down there, sandwiched, but nestled between the foot of the mountain and the beach. And there's That's a road correct. there, and there's Satala, the power generation station there. It's all diesel generators. So from well, Satala, was. you know, <laughs> oh, was, yeah. Well, from Satala, power goes, you know, in both directions, left and right, up and down the road uh, from that power plant. And it goes up the mountain. And it goes straight up the mountain, which is really a 45-degree angle. And you said, Joey, a single span of three, you know, high-voltage conductors goes up to the top. And then there are... Um, uh, Transformers, and, and that's not a lava. That is a mountain that's across the harbor from a lava. That's called Matafao. Did I get that's that correct. right? And uh, that's the tallest point uh, in American Samoa, that Matafao. And th there's no electricity up there. Uh, there. There's no towers up there. It's, it's really tough to get to. Uh, it's a, I think it's a rite of passage into manhood to, to climb that thing. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> <laughs> so, you, you, you get your tattoos, you climb Matafao, you're a man. So... Um, uh, the, yeah, these, so the, these high voltage cables that go 45 degree angle for six, uh, well, for more than 1600 feet, take 1600 feet up, 1600 feet this way and figure what the hypotenuse is. And there you go. That's how long the wires are. Uh, and it's just, just amazing to see those things. If you're up in the mountain and look down and just see them psh, just dive all the way down to the power plant, you really lose sight of them and you can see the power plant down there. So these things in a, in a wind, like in a hurricane, which you're getting to, uh, these things start swinging around and, uh, you know, the power company has often cut the power preemptively. Uh, so these things, uh, you know, in case they hit each other, these much lines. to our chagrin. Yeah, yes. yeah, they cut our power preemptively just to save themselves. Um, so, uh, so Joe, uh, we 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 talked about the tsunami a bit, and uh, you want to uh, well, let's, take, let's look at these pictures in order, and and this will kind of tell the story as, as you want to tell it. Uh, maybe Burke can get the first uh, the first picture up there, aside from the beautiful scenic shots we saw. Well, g generally, uh, it's. Uh the most uh, troubling part of dealing with uh, the plant in American Samoa is dealing with the weather, and that's because whenever it whenever it does decide to have some cantankerous weather, it it has some seriously cantankerous weather, as in cyclones, which are the southern hemisphere version of hurricanes, and those have uh, caused us more problems than anything else because, like uh, like Kirk, you're saying. The yeah, power company decides to turn off the power sometimes. Uh, now, sometimes they will, sometimes they don't. And believe it or not, I can't decide which I like better because there have been times when they left it on that we've ended up with some seriously fried gear. Surge protection is, is no laughing matter. And uh, that power company has been through every bit of surge protection gear we have <laughs> more than once. And it's, uh, yeah, well, here's oh, okay. a... a 
th this is a great example of here. This this photograph that's showing is uh, is our other transmitter site, but it's the same story. The the most important thing that uh, that we can have whenever we're whenever we're going up there to work on something after a uh, um, a weather event is a lot of times it's me going up there or if it's something like oh, I'm on the mainland and I have to send somebody up there that's a non-engineer type that uh, I have a picture and that they have a picture for instance if um, whatever symptom that they describe we're off the air and, and we hear this and, and we can pretty much guess that it's a failed STL um, then I want to be able to send them a picture of the STL uh, receiver on the mountain and say this is where it is this is where it is in the, in the rack and I prepared these little photographs with the little little pointy hands and everything is labeled and there's a whole series of these photographs that uh, allow me to be able to show them uh, what's up there where is it in the rack and then that way whenever I'm talking on the phone to somebody. They they can know what I'm looking at if I'm up there, or if I'm talking somebody else through it. It's it's really uh, it's nice to have that reference. There's another. So this quote. is also at at Olatelli, isn't it? Mm -hmm, it is. All right, and I'll I'll describe this briefly. Olatelli, you can drive to Olatelli almost all the time. Uh, it's it's got a road that goes right up it, and so in fact, uh, FEMA is putting in some emergency generation uh, equipment for uh, for 93 KHJ. Um, and and uh, you know, to keep us on the air if, when the power goes out, and it's all the telly that they're going that they're going to use. Oh, Joey, I'll get back to that. Tell us about this picture real quick. What, what are we looking at? Well, after our latest cyclone, uh, after a night of of uh, fixing things that I uh, didn't really want to have to fix, but did anyway, we had a beautiful sunrise, and uh, in comes the cruise ships. So it's uh, business as usual. It doesn't take long to recover from a, a cyclone. People will always find a way to um, clean up what needs to be cleaned up because if, uh, if the white people are coming with money, we must make sure that we are ready to receive it. In fact, they, this is the bay here. This is part of the bay. This is the east half of Pongo Bay. And um, um, when, when you, what, what this is, of course, it's, it's a blown out uh, uh, volcano caldera, and it's very deep. So it's a very safe place for ships to harbor in that part of the Pacific Ocean. So ships do come from uh, from quite a distance uh, around to take safe harbor in this in this bay. It's very it's very deep and it comes into the island uh, uh, quite a ways, so they can get some safe harbor there. Um, and that's again that's Matafao, and there's some you can see part of the village down there. What's the actual name of the village where the government buildings are? As we're looking at there, Joey. Fangatongo is the seat of government for American Samoa. And that's the uh, village depicted in that last photograph. Fonga Tongo, okay. So, uh, yeah, so we have these two mountains. Oh, yeah, what, what's this? What are we looking at, top of the building? Well, uh, Cyclone Wilma came through in February, and it was uh, a perfect lesson in if there's a job to be done, don't let it wait too long. This is our new STL mast. And we use it to obviously hold the STLs and a couple of backup bays in case uh, everything goes wrong. We can always turn on some backup transmitters from the studio site, and we can cover, we, with about 100 watts, we can cover the harbor area. And this is the new STL. Well, you see the STL transmit antenna at the base of it. Yeah. At the beginning of this, uh, at the beginning of our uh, last cyclone, that STL transmit transmit antenna was not on that mast. It was on the other the other photo, which uh, you'll see just a pile of junk and wreckage. <laughs> about looks, four about really four awesome. in the morning, we hear this uh, gigantic crash. We had been doing really well all night, stayed on the air, giving people updates on this uh, pretty uh, nasty cyclone that was uh, bearing down on us, and uh, we successfully stayed on the air and we felt really good about it knowing that we have all these power issues and we hear the crash we're off the air and I'm knowing that it's this 11 year old STL mast that uh, I keep meaning to get up there and take all the antennas and stuff off of it and move everything instead of just some of everything over to the new mast and there's the the downed one it fell down it pretty much crushed our FM receive antenna our NOAA uh, nor whether radio receive antenna and the uh, STL uh, transmit antenna was at the base of this thing. So, what does that mean? Well, it means that it's four in the morning and you got to get back on the air. So, I slipped a couple of wrenches in my pocket, up the ladder, crossed the roof, 
during a cyclone, about 50 mile an hour gust, very much stinging rain. So it took about 20 minutes to uh, disengage that antenna from the down mast and move it over to the new mast. But it was a great lesson. If there's something that needs to be moved, go ahead and do it now. Do it while the sun is shining rather than having to take shelter every 30 seconds when a new gust comes up and it's trying to blow you off the roof. That's a lesson you learn in, in Samoa. You do stuff while the sun shines. That old phrase, you know, that Grandpa said, make hay while the sun shines, that, that, well, that's true in Samoa. Because if you don't do it while the sun's shining, you're not going to be able to do it. Have you ever seen the, the old movie, a black and white movie called Rain, about American it, Samoa? Oh, it rains. That, that's, yeah, it, it rains a lot. In fact, so I was describing two transmitter sites, Olatelli, which I guess in Samoan means Telephone Mountain. Um, uh, that's accessible, but the main transmitter site that, that our stations are using now uh, is on Mount Alava. And Alava, this, this would be a fantastic place to shoot a four-wheel drive SUV commercial. Oh, you, indeed. You, there, there's about three and a half miles that you have to traverse across the, the ridge of a mountain line. And you, 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 you go to the top of the ridge at this nice, you know, cutover uh, behind uh, 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 Pongo Pongo, and then you, you're, on, um, um, uh, you, you're on some uh, a Forest Service land that they actually lease. And then it's, you know, three and a half or 3.7 miles along this ridge. And, and on many parts of this ridge, you're driving along in whatever four-wheel drive vehicle you got. And five feet to your left or five feet to your right, it becomes 1,600 feet down. That's it. Am I right? Am I right? <laughs> No, no, you, you pretty much got it. And you also hit the nail on the head when you say it would be a perfect opportunity to film a commercial for a four-wheel vehicle, which is exactly why I bought an ATV. That, that was uh, the first order of business after the tsunami. I, so many people had their trucks taken that uh, the usual people that I would bum a ride from, they just weren't available anymore. And uh, if you ever rode a four-wheel vehicle, uh, an ATV, as as a young man and uh, thought that, oh, yeah, it'd be cool to do the things like you see in the commercials. This is that trail. It, it, it takes every bit of uh, ATV driving or four-wheel drive truck uh, skill that you can muster to handle all of it. It's got rocks. It's got inclines. It's got uh, boulders. It's got uh, riverbeds. Huge yeah. mud holes. It's, it's uh, everything that you need to uh, make a a um, auto mechanic happy because you will be visiting. Oh, I, I broke an axle on, on that thing coming down. I broke a Jeep, a Jeep uh, Wrangler axle uh, coming down that thing one time years ago. It's also got a hill that is so steep and there's something about the mud that's so slick that if, if it has rained and your car, get, your vehicle gets stuck and you get out of the vehicle and try to stand up, you cannot. You'll slide right down the mountain. That's how slick it is. That's absolutely right. In fact, uh, I think there was a visiting uh, crew from uh, maybe a, a visiting tower company that was uh, up there to reconnoiter for an upcoming tower repair. And they got uh, halfway up. This, uh, maybe it's, it's uh, not quite 45 degrees, but uh, they got about halfway up this hill, and they started slipping and sliding. In, and there are walls that go about six or eight feet on either side, and it's about two lanes wide. And they got the truck stuck sideways. They couldn't reverse. They couldn't go forward. They ended up having to get a backhoe up there to chain the axle and just pull it back into position so it could drive down. Gosh. So at, this, at the main transmitter site, um, once you finally do get up there, by the way, you can't drive the transmitter site. You can drive uh, to the bottom of, of a steel staircase, and then you're 77 <laughs> steps up to the same level. <laughs> I know yeah. how many there are. Uh, up to the main level is a transmitter site. <laughs> yes, there are eight less than what he claimed. Well, it really, is it, is it 69 steps? Uh-huh. Oh, well, you've done it more than I have. Okay. Yeah. Maybe I got confused because it was so <laughs> difficult. Um, so, uh, hey, I think we may have, uh, we may have one more picture from... Um, uh, from Burke to show us on, on a map. If if you if you guys want to go to Google Earth or Google Maps or you want to find Mount Alava, uh, you may be able to get some good pictures from uh, from Google Maps on on there. It's just an, an amazing place to try to build and run a uh, a radio station. And I'm I'm just I'm delighted to uh, have been asked to be part of it and and still am. I haven't been there in a few years, uh, but I sure would be excited about uh, about going back to it. Um, okay, we're not going to have the, the picture, but, oh, oh, wait, oh, there we are. There we are. Yeah, we're getting close to it. 
Yeah, that's uh, a oh, that's neighbor in Western Samoa. That's Western Samoa, so you want to go to your east about uh, 45, 50 miles or so, and we'll see uh, American Samoa. Um, hey, uh, you know, I <laughs> didn't mean to leave uh, Tom and uh, Chris out of this. We've been talking so much here about this. I just happen to be pretty familiar with the situation because I've, I've built the first, you know, transmitters that were that were at these locations. Uh, Tom Ray, let me bring you in, and Chris, too. You guys got any uh, comments or questions for, for Joe? No, it just sounds like a uh, some of the adventures I had. I used to take care of some stations down in uh, St. Thomas, U.S. Virgin Islands. Oh, uh, but yeah, but, but very, very, very similar. You know, you come off the water, you go straight up. Uh, uh -huh. I can't, I can't tell you how many sets of brakes I've gone through on cars down there. Uh, n nothing like getting a brand new car at the rental place, coming down the mountain, and uh, having smoke pouring out of the front end of the car because uh, you know you're trying not to go screaming through a uh, traffic light at the bottom. Plus, you're driving an American car on the wrong side of the road. So <laughs> <laughs> uh, but but no, you're right. With with the power company and everything else, you just don't don't know what to expect, and it's always an adventure. Yeah, indeed. Mr. Tar, you got any questions for Joe? No, I. You're a bigger man than I. I don't know that. Uh, <laughs> I don't know that I'd want to go through all that. And that is just uh, that's amazing. I, now, and, and it sounds to me like you, you know really a lot of what you're trying to do. And correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, you know it really is kind of you have to, you obviously have to be very self-sufficient. But uh, it sounds like you do a very good job of kind of just documenting everything and what everything does, and and getting people familiar so that when you uh, you know when you have to talk them through it, uh, you know they they know what you're talking about. And, and I guess you know we all kind of you know in engineering management we all kind of go through that because we're not in our facilities all the time. So you know sometimes it's whoever's on the air has to kind of walk through emergency steps and. and and so, you know, what you're doing is it makes a lot of sense for, for a lot of people to do with the pictures that are labeled and things like that. But, uh, wow, that is some, I, I, I just actually just sat back and listened to your story. It's, it's, it's just fascinating. This hour you, uh, had, I'm sorry, go ahead, Joe. Oh, we, we have, there's American Samoa, and you can see the harbor uh, kind of in the middle, just to the right and up from the middle uh, is the big American Samoa harbor that enters from the south uh, of the shore of the island. And uh, this is from, from Google Earth, and there you see a whole lot of beautiful tropical trees. Um, as soon as we zoom out a little bit, we can maybe see where we are. I'm sure that, that's, that's tough to work with. It's a, such a small island that, you know, you zoom in a little bit, and bam, all of a sudden you're, you're all the way zoomed in. You zoom in and out a lot, and all of a sudden it's gone from your screen. So it, it's a little tough to deal with. It's such a small physical area. The island's about, what, four or five miles wide and about 20 miles long. Um, uh, it's a great, beautiful place to, to drive around. And if you really want to take a vacation uh, far from everything, uh, first you fly to American Samoa. Uh, there's the airport, a part of the airport, and, uh, and there's, a, there's a harbor there next to the airport. That's a pretty famous airport. There's a big famous crash that happened there back in the, was that in the 70s, Joe? 76, I believe. Yeah. It, uh, all died. It was bad. Um, uh, or most died. And, uh, but they've lengthened the, the runway, and, uh, you know, yeah, you land on that runway after you've flown for five and a half hours across the Pacific from, uh, from, from Hawaii. Um, or you take a puddle jumper from Apia, uh, Western Samoa. Um, uh, forget, well, I forget what I was just about to, to mention the last thing about that. It's, it's, just, it's an amazing, oh, yeah, if you want to get somewhere far away, there's the Manua Islands, which are about 60 miles to the east, and a little island called Ofu that has an airstrip. And a little resort there, and it's quite the place. You've been to Ofu, haven't you, Joe? Oh yeah, it's the uh, place where you go where you might want to stay two days, but you might end up staying a week because <laughs> the the flight not because you wanted to, but because you had to. It's one of those where the flight schedule is uh, really more up to somebody's whims than any kind of uh, organization. <laughs> The, the oh, plane, much like, the plane, uh, air, yeah. but, much like airplane air travel here in the States. Thank you very much. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> a little like that. A little like that. And, uh, oh, there's a little island at the end. Uh, here, uh, Burke had that on. A little island at the end of American Samoa. Isn't that it, Joe? Yeah, that's um, Aonu'u. Aonu'u. Yes. A, a, a nice little uh, place to uh, put a translator if we could ever get a little piece of land there. But all of the land in American Samoa is is uh, communally owned except for a very, very small percentage of the land, which can be individually owned outright by an individual, uh, which makes it, if you want a place to uh, erect a tower or just to do some kind of project, then it's many, many, many layers of 
of not only government bureaucracy, but of a cultural uh, finessing in order to uh, have access to this land and, and to use it. Because the land is sacred, but also um, the chief could use a new SUV. It's, it is amazing when we got our land on, on Olatelli just to uh, build a little transmitter site. And I mean 30 feet by 30 feet or so uh, is what mm -hmm. we got up there. And it's amazing how many people, families, lay claim to that land when you file the documents saying that you'd like to build something there. And you think you've talk, you're talking to the right person, but then, you know, a lot of other people step forward and say, oh, no, that's my grandfather's land. Oh, no, my grandmother used to plant taro on that land. And uh, yeah, pretty amazing. But it's also amazing uh, how far an SUV will go in getting people to uh, agree to let you build a transmitter site there. Yeah, it's, it's cultural. <laughs> Again, much <laughs> much like the states, actually. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, sure but you know, it's interesting. Joey said that most that most of the land there is owned communally. Uh, I, I I've got a ham radio question for Joey. Uh, I know he's not a ham, and I know he, but, but I was reading this uh, magazine called CQ, and supposedly there's some guy from Germany, or not Germany, from Austria, that uncovered a secret plot in uh, a, a congressional uh, U.S. budget uh, proposal to uh, cut time that hams can be on the air because they're going to be apparently cutting the FCC. Uh, I have no idea what that has to do with my time on the air, but uh, apparently there's some guy in American Samoa it says he's recently subdivided a lot adjacent to his home into one-inch squares that he is selling to U.S. amateur radio operators. Holders of deeds to these plots are registered residents of American Samoa, and in addition to being eligible for amateur radio licenses in that territory, if they become citizens of the country, they would have to pay no taxes to the United States government. So I guess my two questions are, do you know anything about this? And then two, when I buy my one square inch, could you go over once in a while to make sure the neighbors aren't junking things up? <laughs> yeah. Is the guy's name Tommy Greer? Uh, no. Uh, matter of fact, I can't pronounce the guy's name. Um, oh, has a lot uh, of vowels, right? Carl Filiaka? Aliamau Fa Elavale? Oh, mercy. Well, this, this is a ham I haven't heard of. I'm familiar with uh, several, but uh, I'll have to look this guy up when I get back. It's a pretty small uh, area. And, and indeed, he, he's, uh, he's in Utumea. Utumea. Oh, very much. Okay, so that's a, a, a very far-flung part of the island that uh, doesn't sound like he gets to town too much because eventually Uncle Sam is going to come knocking for their taxes. <laughs> Oh, gee. Of Guys, course. I wish we could go on and on. There's so many more tales to tell, and uh, I, I appreciate you uh, you sitting through me telling a couple of them and, and Joey telling a few, too. Uh, we're going to have to wrap up the show, and uh, I, I want to run around and say thanks to everybody. Thanks very much, uh, Tom Ray. Appreciate you being with us tonight from the Hudson Valley of New York. Well, it's good to be back, Kirk. And Chris Tarr, thank you for being with us as well from McWanago, Wisconsin. Oh, great to be here as always. Well, hey, maybe next time we'll let you talk more. Sorry. <laughs> and uh, Joey, uh, from you're in California right now. You're on your way back to uh, American Samoa anytime soon? Well, it's on to Mississippi to see the uh, parents and our uh, stations in the uh, Delta area of Mississippi next week. Then on to Idea Bank in Williamsburg, Virginia. Then back to Pongo Pongo, America, Samoa. All righty. Thanks for being with us, and uh, thanks for the comments in the chat room. Appreciate those. Burke, appreciate you uh, doing the switching there, and thank you for watching. I sure appreciate you very much. Uh, uh, we kind of took a little bit different tack at this time. It wasn't quite so technical, but we did tell a couple of interesting stories. And if you ever get a chance to go to American Samoa, I know that Joey uh, Cummings will uh, welcome you with open arms at our radio stations there, uh, the uh, KKHJ and WVUV stations. By the way, on one, one of the strange places in the world, uh, we have, what, the farthest W and the farthest, no, the farthest south call letters because we're south of the equator, the farthest south W call letter and the farthest west W call letter. I'm getting that wrong. Joey, what's the, yeah. what, what's the, what is it? Well, WVUV was an old military call sign. It was an AM that the military put right. on. And uh, as such, yeah, we do have the farthest west W, and we're the only um, W south of the equator. I guess we're the only USK call letter south of the equator, too, because there's no other, nothing else yeah. south of the equator. In, the in fact, yeah. yeah, that'd be right. Yeah. 
Yeah, so that in the same in the same place, the same uh, U.S. territory, we have a WVUV and KKHJ. All right, that's enough trivia. Hey, guys, we'll see you next week. Appreciate it, uh, you joining us. You can check us out on the web at thisweekinradiotech.com. Subscribe on iTunes. And very soon, if not this episode, awfully soon to be a member of the Twit family. So you'll see us on twit.tv. Appreciate you. We'll see you next week on This Week in Radio Tech. Bye-bye.